Hi, I'm Lil. And I'm Fitz. And you're listening to Knock Once for Yes. It's the end of August, which means it's nearly back to school time, and some of you may be jumping for joy about that. For me, it means that autumn is just around the corner, bringing with it woolly jumpers, steaming soup, roaring fires, and of course, Halloween, so I can't wait. What have we got coming up on today's show, Fitz? Okay, coming up on this episode, we have a rockin' paranormal radar story. (laughs) We have a paranormal postcard from a listener, as well as some more listener stories. I get to go ghost hunting Mm -hmm. with UK Haunted, and we've got an update on our Woodford story from a listener. But before we get into our paranormal radar story, we want to give a big, big thank you to our latest patrons. Rob Robitaille. Tom the Viking. (laughs) Melissa Nelson. Andrea Cole. Diane and Denise of History Goes Bump. And if you haven't already checked out their podcast, we can highly recommend it. I shall be putting a link in the description. And Karen Pomerantz of Bedfordshire Roller Derby, who is also a crime writer. So if you enjoy a bit of roller derby with your crime, you should check out her ebook Trapping Honey on Amazon. We really do give our greatest thanks to our patrons. They saved us from a very sticky situation recently when our recording PC went kaput. Yes, it, it kind of sort of blew up and died a little bit and Fitz has been very busy recently trying to put it all back together. I recorded as much of the process as I could so that you could see what your money's going towards and just a quick reminder if you don't feel that you can make a regular payment that's fine Uh, we can also accept one-off payments through our PayPal on the website. And now that we have a working PC hopefully we can get back on track with making you some bonus content. But now we're off to Yorkshire for our first Paranormal Radar story. So the story pinging the paranormal radar this month is some CCTV footage of a rocking horse in an antique shop that was captured on video rocking by itself in the middle of the night before being hurled off the top of a cabinet and onto the floor. An antiques dealer at Barnsley Antique Centre in South Yorkshire in the UK arrived at work to find a rocking horse he'd bought for the shop's window display lying in the middle of the floor. When he checked the CCTV footage to figure out how it had got there, he was shocked to witness it moving of its own accord. In the video, you can see it on top of a cabinet and it slowly begins to start rocking. It's quite gentle at first and it picks up a little bit of speed, but just before it flies off the cabinet, it almost pauses and then it looks like it's been pushed off quite forcefully and flies off landing in the middle of the floor. Now, it's not the first paranormal incident to have happened in the shop. They've also had a glass cabinet explode for no apparent reason, pictures that have moved on the walls, and some customers have reported that spirits in the shop have spoken to them and that they think the incidents are caused by the ghosts of little children playing around, which is super creepy. Even the owner's family have been affected over the years. When his daughter was 11, she ran screaming from the basement of the shop, saying that an arm had reached out and grabbed her. Ugh. I know. The side of the store was allegedly an old mill in the 18th century, and there's a story that one of the mill owners died or even hung himself on the site. But I've got to say, this story seems to be a little bit sketchy and vague, so I'm not convinced about that. But the owner of the shop says he remains sceptical, but admits that he can't find a good explanation for what he captured on the CCTV footage, and that he's tried himself moving the toy backwards and forwards, how it looks in the footage, but found it impossible to recreate. So Fitz, have you seen the video? What do you think? I think it's probably less convincing than the video they also caught of the glass exploding out of the cabinet that you mentioned. Yeah, that really is pretty spectacular. I mean, for me, the rocking horse is really super creepy because anything rocking gets me. Rocking chairs, (laughs) rocking horses, anything rocking. Yep, that's me creeped out. But the glass cabinet exploding... Why would you fake that? (laughs) I mean, not that I'm saying they they faked the video. I haven't seen anybody debunking the Rocking Horse video yet, but it's one of those paranormal paradox type things where it's a bit too good to be true and it would be so easy to fake it. But the glass cabinet would be incredibly difficult to fake. It's not one of those things where, you know, maybe the cold has got into a crack in the glass and it just sort of splits and falls out. It shatters outwards. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's an issue with the way the camera records but to me it almost looked like the whole pane 
was pushed out in one piece in the middle of cracking. Yeah. And then just exploded. So I don't know again whether it's just that the move the ca- movement was too fast for the camera. It could be because those CCTV cameras perhaps so they don't record all the frames, do they? They mm. only record so many frames per second. So it could be that sort of feeding into it. But yeah, it didn't look like it sort of exploded out from the frame. It looked like the whole pane was pushed out by a few centimetres before it exploded. It's really peculiar. Ever so peculiar. With the rocking horse, um, it's one of those where, you know, for anything like this, you've got to have an element of trust. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the main issues I had with it were one corner of it was out of view. Yeah. So it is always possible that someone or something was manipulating it. Behind it. it. And but the it... way it moved was very unnatural. It wasn't like it had been rocked naturally. Mm. It was like it was being held and it was pushed forward slightly and then back a little bit and it paused at each end. So But you see to me um you know I've got siblings and that just looks like what a toddler does when they're actually on a rocking horse and they're controlling it with their legs and it isn't a smooth movement actually because they're pushing backwards and forwards with their feet and they might pause before they go forwards again that actually made it more creepy for me so it's just the way you look at it isn't it oh yeah possibly i mean yeah i'm not saying it it's definitely not you know there, there wasn't enough there for me to see ah it's definitely a fake no. Um, it just it didn't shout out at me as much as the glass. And the way it fell as well, it just looked like it had sort of it was rocking slightly more to one side and it just looked like one side had tipped over the edge. Because the box it was on had a curved lid. And it looked like it was just rocking along the curve and to me it just slightly rocked over the edge and then fell off it, it didn't look like it had been thrown or anything to me hmm. i mean i'm definitely with you on the exploding glass being more convincing because apart from anything else why would you choose that as some you know if you were going to fake evidence you wouldn't choose something well firstly that difficult to achieve and secondly you're destroying you know a va- possibly valuable antique that's for sale in the shop And thirdly, you've then got to clear up that broken glass and what a mess. It just doesn't seem like the first thing that you'd think of. Yeah, it wasn't just two or three chunks. That thing exploded. It really did. Well, we'll put the links to these stories and videos in the show notes so you can see the creepiness for yourselves and make your own decisions. But for now, I think we'll go to our first story of the episode. This is from Josh Hamblin and takes place in Florida. I have to say, I've been a sceptic most of my life as far as the paranormal goes. I'm one of those people who have never seen a ghost or experienced anything paranormal, so I always assumed it's all a bunch of nonsense. But now, I've come to understand, just because you haven't experienced something, doesn't mean it isn't true. For centuries, millions of people have seen ghosts and other creepy things, so there must be something to it. Six months ago, my brother, who was also a sceptic until now, told me about a ghost he saw in his house one night. He said a man with a beard walked right through him as if he wasn't there. When he did, my brother told me the air was cold. I said, come on Mike, you don't believe in that stuff, do you? He didn't until he experienced it. Seeing the look on my brother's face when he told me the story stuck with me. So I started looking for ghost stories online and paranormal podcasts to try and understand the phenomenon. And I feel like my philosophy of life has changed in the last six months. After listening to your podcast, it reminded me I may have had an experience. Have you ever done something in the middle of the night, then woken up in the morning thinking it was a dream? Then your spouse says, Hey, why did you do that in the middle of the night? And you think, Oh, that was real. This is one of those stories. I lived in the middle of nowhere in Florida, a thousand acres of wildlife management property all around me. My house was about a quarter of a mile from the Withlacoochee River. All the land around was owned by one family in the early 1800s. 
they operated a ferry for people on the trail from Wildwood to Inverness, now State Road 44. On the road before you get to my house, there's an old family graveyard. My wife and I have checked it out a few times. I know in the UK the uh, 1800s isn't that old, but in the US and especially Florida it's like visiting ancient ruins. Two of the gravestones were children who died near the same time. I think one was five and the other was seven when they died. I always wondered what happened. My neighbour, who lived a mile away, told me he had seen ghosts in the graveyard at night. I remember laughing at him and calling him superstitious. In his defence, it is a spooky graveyard with a hundred-year-old oak trees and Spanish moss hanging out of them blowing in the wind. It could scare anyone, I thought. Anyways, one night when my wife was out of town and I had the house to myself, I went to bed and was fast asleep only to be woken up by the sound of sobbing and crying. I opened my eyes to see an old lady in a white nightgown standing at the side of my bed crying. I was startled and scared. But because I'm a little bit of a grouch when I wake up, my fear turned to anger. I sat straight up and yelled right at her. I said something like, What the hell's wrong with you? You don't stand at the side of someone's bed when they're sleeping, that's rude. The look on her face went from sadness to absolute terror. It was as if she had seen a ghost. I felt bad for her, so I told her I'm sorry and she could sleep on the couch if she wants. I led her down the hallway to the living room. On the way to the living room, my reasoning started waking up and I thought, what's going on here? Maybe this could be a ghost. I had heard ghosts could be demons in disguise, so I quickly thought up a test. I sat her down on the couch and got her a blanket and pillow. Then I got a Bible off the bookshelf and tried to hand it to her. I said, if you get scared, just read this. For some reason, I thought this would prove whether or not she was a demon. I don't know what I was thinking. She never stopped staring at me, still terrified. She just sat on the couch silent. Not knowing what else to do for her, and with nerves of steel, I walked down the hallway to my bedroom and went right back to sleep. I'm still not sure if it was something I just dreamed or not. Two things that make me think it was real are, one, it felt so real, and my house was my house, there were no extra rooms or anything out of place like you get in dreams. And two, I felt tired the whole time. I was thinking if I could just get this lady taken care of, I could go back to bed. I don't remember being tired in any of my dreams before. The last option might be the worst. What if it was just some poor old lady suffering from dementia wandered into my house in the middle of the night only to be yelled at by me and left terrified? I think I would rather it be a ghost. Maybe it was the mother of the two children, or maybe a dream. Who knows? Well, that was a really interesting one. Thank you, Josh, for your story. I love that story for so many reasons. The first is that he obviously initially doesn't, he's very sceptical, doesn't believe in any of it, thinks it's Tosh. He has his brother, who he knows and trusts, has an experience and he has the strength of character to admit that he might have been wrong about something. Mm -hmm. And his first instinct is to investigate it with no preconceived notions. It's not, okay, it's definitely this. It's, okay, something's going on. Lots of people experience this. What is it? And that is basically where I came from. I've experienced things like this. I'm generally a bit sceptical. And it's very much a case of, you know, I've experienced something, what is it? And I love delving into it. Obviously, you've got the fun of the spooky aspects of things, but underneath it all is a is a question of what is this? This is really appealing to your very scientific and logical brain, isn't it? Yeah, I just yeah, I just think that's you know, it, it's just the perfect story from that front. It, it's very much, you know, I started one way and I've investigated it and I've not come to any conclusions and 
because it's so difficult to prove anything one way or the mm. other, there, there aren't really any conclusions as far as I'm aware to make yet. No, there aren't. As much as we wish that there were, <laughs> like you say, there really you cannot come to a conclusion most of the time. I really hope it wasn't a little old lady with dementia, though, I have to say. <laughs> but it was very sweet that his first thought was to tuck her up on the sofa with a blankie. Well, exactly. This is the other thing I love about this story. You know, he, he's woken up in the middle of the night, something freaky is going on, and his first instinct is I'll find this little old lady a, a cushion and, <laughs> and a blankie. It's, you know, I've got to look after this person. Even if it might be a demon. <laughs> yes. Even if it's a demon, I'm going to get it a blankie and then I'm going to go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> it really brings a new meaning to the term putting the demons to bed. <laughs> and I have to say, I can empathise. I am also very grouchy when I wake up. Woe betide anybody that wakes me up in the middle of a sleep cycle, as Fitz can attest. Yes, she growls first, punches second, <laughs> you ignore the growl at your peril. <laughs> and yes, I also do understand what you mean about when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're conscious enough to be able to deal with something, but you're not really awake enough to know why you were doing it or really understand your actions. I have had occasion to, to do that. And it is different to being in a dream. Like you say, when you're in a dream, often things, even if they seem very realistic, things are out of place. Like your house isn't quite the same as your actual house. Mm -hmm. and you don't tend to feel tired in a dream. So, yeah, just pretty fascinating. Whereas I can do things in my sleep and not notice. Have no recollection of them at all. <laughs> <laughs> and we go now from Florida to New Orleans after receiving a paranormal postcard from one of our listeners. We love getting paranormal postcards from our listeners. And this one is from Andrea, who recently visited New Orleans. She writes... Hey Lil and Fitz, here are some of my New Orleans pictures. The first is a cemetery in the city. Unlike everywhere else in the US, New Orleans is severely under sea level. It's a bowl shape or basin and prone to floods. Not to mention, it's a swamp, so you aren't allowed to bury the dead. A few occasions of corpses floating around and you have to build tombs instead. These can hold many bones. When someone dies, they're placed in the bottom and hopefully when the next family member dies, they're skeletons by then, so the bones are boxed and moved upwards. Some are just one person. It depends on the will when purchased, but can be very expensive. So if you can't afford this, you can be cremated or put into a concrete wall. Spooky, but some are beautiful. The second picture is a haunted plantation called Oak Alley. You can see how it got its name from the second photo which is taken looking out from the second floor down the grand avenue of oak trees. Legend has it that the last owner still hangs around and turns the lights on and off. So thank you, Andrea, for your paranormal postcard. We really enjoyed it. I particularly liked the photo of the tree-lined avenue. At first thought, I, I looked at it and it looked very familiar to the sort of tree-lined avenues we have over in the UK. But I looked at the path and thought, man, that path is tiny. <laughs> and then I looked at the tiny specks of people on it and thought, no, no, the tar path's not tiny. The trees are huge. The scale is tremendous, isn't it? It is a wonderful photograph. And obviously, we will put these up on the Instagram and Facebook so you can all have a look at them. Now, budding anthropologist that you are, I bet you couldn't <laughs> leave the uh, burial system of New Orleans alone. I think nerd is the word you're looking for, but no, of course I couldn't. I had to have a look at the um, Experience New Orleans website, in fact, which does a very good job of explaining that early settlers tried lots of different ways to solve the problem of burying their dead in an area where the water table is so high that digging only a few feet down will cause the grave to fill with water and the casket to float. They tried weighing the caskets down with stones and even boring holes in the coffins to allow the water to flow through. But after a rainstorm, the rising water table would force the coffins back out of the ground. So eventually they began to inter their dead above ground in the Spanish tradition of building vaults. As Andrea mentions, one vault can hold multiple family members, but most cemeteries have a temporary holding vault for those occasions when the last body to be interred is still a bit too fresh to be moved to accommodate the latest addition. Apparently, two years is normally considered adequate time for a body to be um, seasoned, is a good word, maybe enough to move. The Oak Alley Plantation looks absolutely stunning. I wish we could visit there. And it also sounds like it's pretty darn haunted. 
Apparently, it was professionally investigated by the International Society for Paranormal Research, who encountered several spirits there, including a six-year-old boy, a young girl of around 14, several of the women who originally owned and ran the house, and not least, the ghosts of a group of Confederate soldiers. The staff at Oak Alley have reported poltergeist phenomena and one tour group watched as a candle was inexplicably thrown several feet across the dining room. So that's something going on our haunted travel wish list then. Definitely. That's on the travel plan. (laughs) Well, not only did Andrea send us a paranormal postcard, but she's also sent in her own story. And I think we'll listen to that now. I live in Powder Springs, Georgia, in the US which is a small town a few miles outside Atlanta. In the southern US, we have some remaining Civil War battlefields and ruins scattered around that escaped being burned or demolished by General Sherman. Near me is the Kennesaw Battlefield, as well as several smaller ones. In the middle of Georgia, in a small town, lies the Confederate prisoner of war camp called Andersonville, It definitely has a dark history, as it's mainly giant holding pens made of logs that captured men were stuck in. Deplorable conditions. Many died of dysentery or starvation. It's said that of the 45,000 Union soldiers held there, 13,000 died. The site also contains the Anderson National Cemetery, and the National Prisoner of War Museum. I first went there on a day trip with my grandparents when I was very young, only around five to seven years old. I've always been sensitive, and luckily my grandmother helped me learn how to use it at a young age. As soon as we walked out onto the grounds, I felt very overwhelmed. Although I was young and had not read up on the site, I could tell that something horrible had happened there. We went into the reconstructed pens and I immediately said, Grandma, this is awful. Do you feel it? It was the most depressing feeling I've ever had, even to this day. I kept getting images of people crowded, shouting and moaning. It was almost like I was there. We continued to walk the grounds And once I got out of the pen, it got better, but it left me shaken. Though I am much older now, it has stuck with me all these years. I never saw any spirits, but I think the images and sounds I heard were enough for me. In 2009, I went to Italy with my college music ensemble to do a few performances. We performed in the Matera a small rural town in the tip of the shoe if you're looking at the map. The town is very old. The people still lived in caves until the 1950s, and the modern town is built on top. It's full of spirits. I distinctly remember seeing a very old man walking through town. He had a long beard and walked with a cane. Also, an older woman with a load of laundry. It had such an amazing feel to it, you could just sense how old it was, and the slight struggle and despair that comes from poverty and hard work. One of my fellow musicians called me out. You stare off a lot. You see ghosts, don't you? Yes, I said, and proceeded to point out several spirits to him. I've never seen so many in one place. But it was a very pleasant feeling. No negative presence at all. Well, thank you to Andrea for those two great stories. I think we're actually going to have to give Andrea credit on this show because with the stories and the postcard, she's done almost (laughs) as much work as we have. (laughs) I think she has. Shout out to Andrea. Thank you for writing half the show for us. (laughs) I must admit that both those stories resonated with me, but in different ways. Mm. Uh, The first one, obviously, you've got a place of great distress and suffering. Um, And having been to similar places like Battlefields in the UK Mm. and Auschwitz, they they all have a sort of similar feeling. Um, 
I think the most intense I've ever felt it was at Auschwitz. Oh, it's I can just, only imagine. I couldn't. It's you just can't comprehend it at the no. time. It's just so horrific. Your mind just won't accept it. But to a lesser extent, battlefields here, you just have that feeling. It's yeah. We had a similar thing at the battlefield of Naseby, didn't we? You, mm-hmm. There's just a sense of something that happened and it it kind of makes sense to me anyway that somewhere where you've had so much fear and pain and I mean this is a prisoner of war camp so the misery I I can see how it would sort of impact and leave an imprint on the very soil almost Mm. and it's almost like the opposite effect happened in her trip to Italy yeah and that it was all very pleasant there were people going about their business and it was more of a case of you know, you're always sort of um, theory crafting with this sort of thing, but it's almost like, you know, they, they never wanted to leave. You know, they were so happy being oh, there. That that's it was a just... really sweet way of looking <laughs> at it. But yeah, she did describe it as a really positive experience. And well, I personally, and I think you have too, have had experiences that have felt not at all spooky um, and have very much felt like just another person going about their business, albeit perhaps in slightly different time frame (laughs) yeah we had something at uh, my parents house uh, while i was growing up and it did feel very much like even if you were in your at home alone it felt like there was somebody there with you as opposed to something there scaring you yeah you know if you saw it or caught it out the corner of your eye it was like oh that's fine i'm not alone yeah (laughs) so more of a comforting presence yeah very much so Well, as you know, I've always said that I I don't understand why people think it has to be dark or nighttime or why they have to go around turning all the lights off to see a ghost because personally I've seen more during the day than at night time. But I think that probably a lot more people have had a paranormal experience than they realise because when you see a ghost during the day, unless it's in period clothing or, you know, it's very blatantly out of time, you wouldn't necessarily notice that there was anything out of the ordinary. No, I mean, even if they were, to be honest, this, your first thought is, oh, you know, they must be going to an event or something. Yeah, and exactly. You've got so many reenactors and people that do historical tours and things like that that it, it's not that unusual. No. I think having been on a train once with a group of reenactors <laughs> and, you know, it's all these people in sort of medieval costume piling on the train. Your mind doesn't instantly go to ghosts. <laughs> yeah, you, your brain doesn't go, oh, blimey, these must be medieval ghosts catching the train to London. <laughs> <laughs> But obviously when it's in the middle of the night or it's dark, you're just more inclined to realise that there's something out of the ordinary than you would be during the day, I think. Yeah, definitely. Well, we're going to head back to the UK now. Yorkshire again, in fact, for our next story, which is from Sarah Stone. I've always had a keen interest in the paranormal, but never had an experience at all until a few years ago. I've lived in the same house for 21 years, a mid-terrace townhouse built in the mid-30s, and I can safely say that it was not haunted at all until we had our fourth child in late 2012. A few things happened at the same time that could have caused the activities. Our elderly next-door neighbour on our left side gifted us a beautiful wardrobe that was about 70 years old and had stood in her house for that whole time. We also had a loft conversion, and our other elderly neighbour on the right side of us fell ill, and we had to go into his house to look after it. His house was the creepiest house I have ever been in, so maybe something followed us back to our house for a bit of company while our neighbour was in the hospital. Whichever one of these things caused the things to start happening, it didn't do things by half. We got the deluxe package of hauntings. Strange smells that you could literally step into and out of, which my sister experienced and was amazed by. Bright, blinding flashes of light, like a camera flash going off, but much brighter. This happened a number of times, even once in our living room when we had four guests witness the flash while they were talking, and no one had a camera or phone out at the time. My husband used to see the apparition of a boy, and we would all see black, 
things darting across the corners of our eyes. My smallest child would suddenly scream and run and cling to me physically shaking, saying that she could see boys' legs. This was terrifying as I could see nothing. There was a lot more on top of this too. As I said, I like ghosts, but I didn't want one as a pet. When things started to happen, it would be slow at first. Then it would ramp up and get bad. It would calm down, but just as suddenly fire up again. But after a couple of years, it just disappeared altogether. I have lots of stories from that time, but I will start with the strangest thing that happened to me personally. Our house has three floors, kitchen and living room on the ground floor, three bedrooms and a bathroom on the middle floor, and a big bedroom and bathroom on the top floor in the attic. I was on the middle floor folding washing and chatting to my eldest daughter Phoebe, who was 14 at the time. We were standing at the bottom of the stairs that lead up to the attic. She had her back to the stairs, and I was facing looking towards them. At that point, my husband walked down the stairs from the attic. I looked at him, and he gave me a weird look as if something was wrong, kind of glaring at me the whole time he was walking down the stairs. I thought, what's wrong with him? As he got to the bottom of the stairs, he walked straight into Phoebe's room, which was opposite. I was watching him the whole time because he rarely goes in Phoebe's room, and I was wondering why he was going in there. As he got to the middle of the room, he stopped, turned around, and looked right at me, again, with a look that said something was wrong. He continued further into the room around the corner so I could no longer see him. I thought he wanted to speak to Phoebe and was just waiting for her to finish talking to me and go back into her room. So as soon as I lost sight of him, I grabbed my washing and walked straight up the stairs he'd just come down and Phoebe went into her room. But as I got to the top of the stairs and walked into the attic room, I saw my husband, sitting on the futon with my two smallest children, snuggled up watching TV. At first, my brain could not understand what was happening. I just stood there washing in hand, incredibly confused. They all looked at me, wondering what was wrong, and I think I spluttered out something along the lines of, "'How did you get up here? I just saw you go downstairs.' Then it hit me what must have just happened. It wasn't my husband, but something else. My stomach dropped to the floor. I got really upset. My husband got up and was asking me what was the matter. I told him I'd just seen him go downstairs into Phoebe's room, explaining what had happened But he said he'd been sat on the futon for at least half an hour and hadn't moved. He ran down the stairs to check the room, but it was just Phoebe in there, and she said there'd been no one else in there when she entered. I was really freaking out at this point. I saw my husband walk down the stairs only two feet away from me. He looked directly at me, right into my eyes. He was solid and real, and I was looking at him for a good five to ten seconds. Phoebe said she didn't see her dad walk downstairs or go into her room, but I saw him walk right past her. There was no way he could have got back upstairs, because as soon as I lost sight of him in Phoebe's room, I walked straight up the stairs he'd just come down. In the end, I had to compose myself for the kids' sake because I was scaring them. I had not been drinking and I don't take drugs. So how could this be? I have a few other stories to tell you from when our house was experiencing paranormal activity. 
but I'll send them in another time. And thank you so much to Sarah for sending in that story. It was fantastic, and we are hoping that your other stories are just as good as that one. <laughs> it had so many elements that we need to unpack. There's the fact that there are so many things that are common to a lot of stories. And that we've experienced ourselves. And a lot of things that are perhaps not necessarily common, but that we've experienced, yeah. like you say. The, the one that really jumped out at me, because I had it happen to me fairly recently, mm. was the legs just seeing the legs i was at my mum's house feeding her cats while she was away and there was one point when i turned around and the, the where i was standing in the kitchen you could see the steps and i could just see from sort of the knee down i'm sure they were my mum's legs like literally just knee down to foot but translucent walking down the stairs oh that's creepy isn't it it, oh. it was pretty why, creepy and it was weird why just legs I, it, why just legs well, I don't know. And, you know, she's alive, so yeah. it's another one of those things where... <laughs> Just an off Holly Bob's. <laughs> yeah, you know, do, do you hear about doppelgangers and things, but I've never heard of a sort of partial doppelganger that's semi-translucent. <laughs> <laughs> and it would be quite obviously your mum's legs as well, because she's very, very small, bless her, isn't she? She's pretty tiny, so yeah, is that how you could her, tell that it was her it legs? It was someone of a very similar build. A very similar stature. Mm. Well, the thing that jumped out to me was seeing the black things shooting across the corners of their eyes because that is something we experienced at one of our houses so much we actually gave them a nickname um, and we refer to them as skitterers because they kind of skitter across the corner of your field of vision and th one of our cats actually used to chase them so it wasn't just us seeing them um, but more about that in a later episode I won't spoil it <laughs> <laughs> but going back to the sort of common themes with these sort of things um there was quite a few things that jumped out at me. Actually, one of them was the loft conversion. So you tend to find with renovations, alterations, of activity. We hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, bringing a new child home. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, this time I think it, she said it was her fourth. Yeah, and often it's the first one yeah, that's going to kick something up. But who knows? Yeah, yeah. There's no hard and fast rules in this <laughs> business. <laughs> and also. She said when they went to visit the neighbour's house and there was a creepy vibe there and yeah. they felt maybe they'd brought something home. Yeah, you things can follow hear you. that sort of thing as well. So there's And don't forget the wardrobe. They were gifted an antique wardrobe. So bring it, we're back to Haunted Collector Grounds here. <laughs> My favourite show. Um, yeah, if you bring in, in something from the house and you don't know its origins and it's old, there could be an attachment there. Yeah, so you've got a number of choices. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But one thing that's not such a common occurrence is her experience with the doppelganger of her husband, if indeed it was a doppelganger. Yeah, that was a really interesting part of the story. Mm. And it was almost... I, I sort of With things like doppelgangers and, and things like that, where you're seeing somebody that you think you know, obviously, when you're out and about, a lot of the arguments tend to be, oh, it's just someone that looks like them or dresses like them. It's just which, a coincidence. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, she's in her own house. Yeah. There is no way that's going to be explained away. <laughs> exactly. She's in her own house and it's her own husband, mm. so she's going to expect to know what he looks like. <laughs> but it was the fact that it's almost as if she was seeing him at another time. Well, and he looked confused to see her, like he was seeing her from in another time. Yeah, so as to whether she was seeing something just out of place in time, as it were, or something ghostly, I'm not sure we'll ever know. But no, but quite a disturbing experience, though. So, thank you to Sara for that fascinating story. I noticed you mentioned you did have some more, so we're uh, waiting with bated breath for you to send those in. And if anyone else has a story they'd like to share on the show, please do get in touch. Uh, if you visit our website, www knockonceforyes.com and visit the send us your stories page you can find out how to submit your stories including writing us an email or recording your own story and sending that in to us to play on the show well next up we have an interview for you and if you follow us on twitter you'll know that fitz recently went on a ghost adventure of his own the paranormal investigation group uk haunted were kind enough to give us a few minutes of their time for an interview and also invited us to stay on for the investigation of a vacant care home. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't make it, but Fitz jumped at the chance. So we're going to bring you that interview now and then talk to Fitz about what he experienced during the investigation. 
Okay, after some minor technical difficulties, we are here with UK Haunted for an investigation of an abandoned elderly people's home in Northampton. I'm sure most of our listeners know who you are, but uh, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a quick rundown of UK Haunted. Hello, my name is Mickey. I'm Alex, the other half of UK Haunted. Uh, basically, we have a paranormal team and we travel the UK searching for the afterlife, for, for ghosts and spirits. Uh, it's just the two of us um, in UK Haunted. And, uh, yeah, that's about it, really. Have you had much success so far? Uh, yeah, I think over the... We've been together five years now, and I think over the years we've caught an awful lot to yeah. probably change a few uh, sceptics' minds that have joined us on a few occasions, and yeah. quite a lot of stuff that we've captured as well. And with it being just the two of us, we find you can control it, the investigation a lot more. Um, so if there's a noise in one sort of direction and I know my Mickey is somewhere else and I know it's not him, um, so he kind of, it definitely helps. We've had, um, we've seen things, uh, heard things from doors banging, um, voices on some of our equipment that's intelligent, telling us uh, responses to our questions. Um, me personally, I've seen a full body apparition in the day, uh, walking along in a graveyard and then they disappeared. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. That's one thing I did want to ask about, actually. Why is it that most investigations are at night? Because a lot of the things I've personally seen have been sort of day or night. It doesn't mm. seem to distinguish between the two. Well, I think people say this, oh, you have to go to the night. Well, that's probably because at night time, most people have gone home. You don't get outside noise. You don't get a lot of traffic on the roads. And also, when it's, it's darker, your eyes actually open more, the pupils mm. dilate, so you can actually... If you were going to see something, you've got, probably got a better chance of seeing it at night time when yeah, it's a lot so darker. Pupils actually dilate, don't yeah. they, during night time. So you, that's why the corner of the eye stuff you can kind of see. But um, one of the main things is it's a lot spookier at night, isn't it? And that's why yeah, it's scary. People like to be scared, and that's why kind of a lot of people do um, go out and do the ghost hunt. And I mean, even from a young age, people would go out with their friends and oh, let's go and do a ghost hunt, and it kind of gives you the buzz. And then when you get a bit older, it's maybe you want to see actual, you want some answers, not mm. just to maybe be scared. Mm. Um, and that's when, when you go on an investigation, um, which kind of me and Michael try not to do, is, is to get scared. So obviously, when you see something, it's going to make you jump. It doesn't matter who you are, if you see yeah. something, and you're not expecting to see, uh, <laughs> obviously, a ghost or something come out in front of you, um, you're going to jump. But it's just about controlling it and kind of realising why you're there. You're there to, to get that sort of stuff. And the thing, the worst thing you could probably do is scream and run off because um, that's what you're there for. If you're mm. going to do that, why are you there? Yeah. So. so what's been your most interesting investigation so far? I think, <clears throat> for me, the first time we went to the Ancient Ram Inn, because uh, obviously it's world famous for being like, really evil and good old John Humphreys was there at the time. And things are trying to attack him at night in his bed and... I remember saying to you, oh, we need so much protection. And you said, don't be stupid, you know. Uh, I think that, that one, for me, it was like, wow, this is, mm. this is a big deal sort of thing. I think that's it, yeah, those sort of locations. And say East Drive as well, that's been kind of so hyped up maybe by TV and media and stuff, the most haunted place in Britain, in the world, in Europe. And when we go there, um, obviously you've got to try and go there with an open mind. It's difficult when you've seen things. Um, and this is why a lot of investigations we do, we try not to research too much because it can kind of play on your mind a little bit, especially if you're expecting it to be mm. really kind of scary and dark, sort of haunting. Um, but it's, you've just got to go there with an open mind. And when we've done those sort of locations, we haven't maybe had kind of crazy stuff. We've had activity, mm. um, but maybe not kind of crazy kind of poltergeist being hit and all that Like it's been stuff. hyped up in the, the press. Uh, and, and that's the thing. Yeah. I think a lot of people realise that where they kind of think that ghosts are there to scare you and hurt you and all this, but kind of 99% of the time, we we kind of find that they want to just let you know they're still around mm. and want to communicate, really. Mm. Yeah, so. it's one thing I've found an issue with a lot of the sort of TV shows and things is they always hype everything up and, you know, there's big bangs and crashes. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. Having sort of lived in <clears throat> places that are pretty active, you, know, you can go months between anything happening at all. Oh, of course. And yet yeah. they always seem to turn up at the right time for well, stuff yeah, to so go we off. know people that do investigations, um, some of our good friends, and they do it for a year, two years at the same sort of place, going back and just documenting evidence and stuff. And that's mm. kind of a real 
paranormal investigation when you're doing that sort of thing. Whereas TV, I mean, we've done the TV before, um, so we can kind of speak about the industry. People mm. are there to sell a product. Yeah, it's the same with kind of events and. This is why when we do our own events, we kind of say to people, you've got to go there. You've got to ask questions when you go on these sort of things. Even seeing things on TV, ask questions. If somebody's honest and doing it for the right reasons, they're going to tell you, this could be this, this could be that. But you've got to be realistic and keep it real. Um, but at the end of the day, everything is like with TV and it's an industry. So they're trying to sell your product. And if they're selling something that doesn't look very good, then nobody's going to buy into it. But then again, we've seen a lots, of, lots and lots of things that we can't explain. Mm. So if you're there for a, for a long enough amount of time and you're there for the right reasons, mm. you will get activity. It might only be something small, but it's, it's, I'd rather personally have something that I know I can't explain than anything else. And that's why I kind of do it and probably mm. Mickey would both do it together because that's why we want the real evidence and answers to our questions. Excellent. Have you got any thoughts on uh, what we might experience tonight, or are we just going in blind? Uh, <laughs> we've had some activity. This is the second time we've done this interview. <laughs> yeah, we are actually hearing a, hearing a few noises down one of the corridors over there, so mm. I think we might start in one of those areas tonight. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's just it's so big, and who knows what's going to happen. That's the, that's the paranormal for you. You don't know what's going to happen. I think this sort of location as well, when you go to any location, you've got to put yourself into the people in who were there, you've got to put yourself into their shoes and maybe think how how would they have communicated um, when, when the spirits, when the people were living here. Um, so it's maybe, I mean, myself and Mickey, we actually work in care. Um, so maybe we can bring some of that experience into the investigation um, and see what response is. And it may, you've just you've got to think outside the box. It may sound silly, but even asking a spirit if they'd like a cup of tea, <laughs> how would they like a biscuit or something like that, that may get a response. Mm. And it's mm. the everyday questions. Instead of, oh, can you do this? Hello, who's there? Asking those sort of questions every two seconds. Mm. If, you, if you think outside the box and think, well, how would somebody have kind of communicated when they were here? So hopefully if we kind of go with those sort of tactics tonight, then we should get some yeah. responses. We're looking course. forward to this one. Mm. Excellent. Well, I won't take up any more of your time, but uh, Thank thanks you. very much for that. And hopefully, no we'll problem. have a quick catch up uh, once things are done and yeah, we'll see yeah. if we've got anything. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. So, I have so many questions because you came back from this investigation absolutely buzzing and just raring <laughs> to go on the next one. I could just see the excitement and glee in your eyes. <laughs> But my first question has to be, um, towards the end of that interview, there was quite an audible bang in the background. Now, was that you guys? No, no, it wasn't us. So you were all just sitting still? I mean, give me... Yeah, a- there was there were six of us there. Um, and basically, while we were doing the interview, that there, there were three other people that had joined us. And they were sat quietly on the other side of the room, on the floor, not near anything. And uh, the three of us were sat on a bench with the microphone just in front of us um, doing the interview. And the the bang came from a corridor just off to one side of us. And oh. it, it, I'd been there for, I don't know, perhaps an hour at that point. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other three people had turned up roughly when I turned up. And we'd been there for quite a while. Nothing had happened. And it was only after Mickey and Alex turned up and we were sort of starting to sit down to do the interview that we started hearing things. And you could actually pinpoint where they were coming from as well. Yeah. Oh, and as they mentioned, we were having some technical problems. So that was actually the second time we'd done the interview. I was going to ask about that because he brought it up. So what happened? Well, annoyingly, like possibly the best evidence I've ever sort of come across. Personally. Personally, um, I lost because oh, we were, we were no. doing the interview to start with. And um, we were going through, I was asking similar questions and what have you. And at one point, I distinctly heard in my headphones somebody say hello. Oh, my God. I had one one ear on, one yeah. ear off, so yeah, that yeah. I could listen to them talk and respond. And you but heard yeah, the in, th- in the ear with the headphone, I heard hello, and I didn't hear it with my other ear. Oh, my God. And why would, you know, neither of them would say hello to you at that point anyway? No, we were in the middle of an interview. Yeah, yeah we'd, we'd done all our hellos and introductions and whatnot quite quite some time ago. But then and it didn't record? No, the whole interview didn't record. I was absolutely gutted. Oh, no. That is absolutely gutted. But 
I mean, have they come across this kind of thing, this technical technical issues before? Yeah, they said you know it's very common. You know, they've they've experienced it so many times. You notice them chuckling when they talked about you know yeah. this is the second time we've done it. Ha, you know, technical problems because I mean, it's, it's just it's such a common thing. Well, it is something. I mean, you see it a lot in TV investigations, but obviously you don't know whether that's you know really happens in in sort of real investigation. But clearly, it does. Yeah happen in real investigations. Yeah, never had it before. It, you know, it, it literally caught the first few seconds of me um, so that I could see it was recording. And then just And then gone. I popped it down because I was recording on my iPad because so, so I needed something portable. Um, so yeah, I popped it down on the floor. Once I'd seen it was recording, uh, looked down, saw that it was fine and just got on with the interview. And it was only when I looked down again to see that it had just stopped recording. It just gone. But I've got to say, it's pretty professional of you to not freak out when you heard the voice. Because if that had been me, I'd have been jumping up and down going, guys, I heard the voice. <laughs> I think my eyebrows might have lifted in surprise slightly. <laughs> That's <but> so British. <laughs> I said, I'm doing an interview, God damn it, and I'll finish it. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Luckily, they were really good about it and were quite happy to repeat the interview. Oh, bless them. <laughs> so, did you hear any other voices that night? Was that the only one? Um, voices, as in actual voices, yes. Oddly oh, enough, really, we did. like with your own ears. Yes, with my own two ears. Oh, yeah. We were we'd split up into two groups at that point. Uh, we were in the kitchen and we tried one of the um, spirit boxes. Spirit boxes uh, weren't really getting anything at all on that. And uh, they'd got one of the Mel meters, you mm -hmm. know, the EMF and temperature things. They got one of those out. Nothing was happening. So we were asking lots of questions and, you know, we weren't really getting anything at all. And then from down the corridor, we could hear shouting. <gasps> shouting? It wasn't loud, loud. Um, but yeah, that sort of tone of voice where you can tell it's yeah, being projected. Yeah, it, it was sort of a shouting tone of voice, like two people arguing. or Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so, of course, we radioed the other guys uh -huh. and said, you know, you're making a lot of noise. And they said, no, we're sitting quietly. Oh, that's creepy. Yeah, it was really weird. And, you know, there's nothing around. Um, so, you know, it was in, on a secure site with yeah. the gate locked. So, so you're not going to get much noise bleeding in from outside? Because no. this was the middle of the night, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we we were there. I can't remember what time we got there. I think it was for about eight, nine o'clock. But, you know, this was perhaps 9, 10 ish it was getting pretty late because mm. uh, this was quite early on in the investigation but yeah definitely sounded like two people arguing oh so did you see anything I think so you think so please do tell well there was one point when we were taking a bit of a break and we'd gone back to the sort of central area that the building itself is like a big round octagonal room mm -hmm. and off that there's four wings and at the end of one of the wings you've got two apartments or two houses bolted on the end so we're in this sort of big central room with all the corridors leading off and uh literally we're just sort of standing around chatting and just you know relaxing a bit after sort of wandering around being quiet in the dark sort of thing and i turn around and i'm sure i saw a dark figure behind me and it literally made me like spin and jump in the air oh god um and i think uh i'm not sure if it was mickey or alex but one of them said you know you're right you've just seen something i'm mm. sure i just saw something there and this comes after a, sort of a whole evening of walking around a dark yeah. building and going you know Am I seeing something over there? Is it just my eyes playing so tricks on me? So you were acclimatised to sort of fleeting shadows by this point. You're not going to be jumping at the the slightest thing. Well, that was the only time when it was instinctual. Yeah. If you know what I mean. It like wasn't a, a case of, reaction. am I seeing something? Is that just my eyes playing tricks on me? It was literally my body went, react, react, react. Oh, no. God, that's scary. So it's just a shadow. Yeah, it was literally sort of... Well, a human-sized black thing. It's a proper shadow figure. Yeah, I didn't really see enough to make out any detail. Mm. As um, is often the case, though. Yeah, I literally, I just, you know, you had, your body has that moment of yeah. and jumps, <laughs> and when I looked back, there was nothing there. But just that instant, I, I'm fairly certain I saw something. 
So, not to question your manliness, but at any point were you really, did you get freaked out? Or was that maybe when you got freaked out seeing the shadow figure? Um, it certainly made me jump, as in it made my heart race. Mm. Um, and I think it was one of those where you're like subconsciously scared, if you know what I mean. I mean yeah, you there's kick obviously, in the fight or flight instinct. Yeah, I need, it wasn't that scary because you're, you're in a group of people mm. for a start, so you're not on your own. Although I think there was a couple of points where um, they said, you know, just got off here or do what have you. <laughs> I left you to it. <laughs> yeah, but it, it wasn't for long and you know, the, I didn't really experience anything at that point. Um, although I say that actually, uh, I wasn't quite alone. Uh, this was at the very end of the evening. Mm. Uh, well, I say evening, it was about three uh, o'clock in the morning in the at morning. that point. <laughs> and we were just finishing up down a corridor that we'd had a bit of activity in before. And uh, everyone walked back and you know, they said to me, you know, if you're at the back, then just knock on the doors as you come through and just see if you can encourage anybody to sort of come through. So as I'm walking back, I'm knocking on the doors going, you know, come on, it's time to get up or, you know, time for breakfast, have a cup of tea. The <laughs> amount of times we asked if they wanted a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have had to have had several Burkos going to supply all the tea we offered. All the tea bags in England. Yep, tea and biscuits. <laughs> so I was walking down the corridor, banging on all these doors and yeah, we hadn't really got anything. And literally the minute we'd got through to the end of the corridor into the, the big octagonal room and shut the door, we started hearing doors slamming and handles going and thumps and walking and all sorts. Oh my word. Yeah. And it was literally like, oh God, you know, it's just <laughs> three in the morning. I'm so tired. I just want to go to bed. <laughs> and we're hearing all this stuff. Yeah. We're just sort of sitting going, oh, you know, I'm so tired and getting ourselves together before we went and yeah really and but you'd open the door and look down and it would all stop and be oh. quiet and then you'd shut the door again and within a couple of minutes it was boom slam <gasps> grr, 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 and like rattling doors and things so i wonder if either they just really wanted that cup of tea mm -hmm. or they really wanted you to get out and be done for the evening <laughs> i'd shut up and go home <laughs> go home already <laughs> <laughs> we don't need any more tea <laughs> So it was a pretty active night then. It certainly was. Between all of us, we, we definitely had a lot more experiences than I've discussed. I can't wait to see that full video when UK Haunted release it. Yeah, I'll be putting a link in the description to their YouTube channel, so keep an eye out for when that comes out. And thank you so much to Mickey and Alex from UK Haunted for letting me join them on the investigation at a really great time. I can confirm he did. He was hopping with excitement. Indeed. When I came home, I risked the aforementioned wrath of Lil uh, <laughs> to tell her all about it at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Which is not normally advisable <laughs> at all. <laughs> right, before we go, we've got an update on our Woodford story for you, but I've just got a little paranormal blooper before that from our investigation. Oh, yes. Yes. At one point, we were in a room. We had one of the um, ghost boxes mm -hmm. going and uh, we were asking questions and at one point we heard a growl oh yeah and both mickey and i turned around and went oh, did you hear that oh, god and the first thing we were with went it was my stomach <laughs> <laughs> oh no it's brilliant it, it could happen to anyone yeah it's fantastic but it's just the way it's like oh, did you hear that oh yeah i would have freaked out <laughs> <laughs> excellent well, that's just about all we've got time for this episode. But before we finish up, one of our listeners has kindly sent us an update on our Woodford Church story. Yes, a little while ago, we did a segment for a collaboration episode with The Strange Matters, Don't Break the Oath and Saying This Podcasts. And in it, we discussed the local legend of Woodford Church, where there have been sightings of ghostly monk in robes and a famous photograph captured an apparition kneeling at the altar of the church. We talked about the discovery of an embalmed heart and the possibility that the owner of the heart was a Templar knight. One of our listeners heard the tale and very kindly sent us some pretty fascinating information that may explain some of the things we were wondering about with regards to the robed apparition. Richard tells us, Templars were monks as well as knights, and Templars did wear their armour under their robes. Also, 
It was not unusual for knights and even pilgrims to want their heart preserved and placed somewhere they held dear. This was the case with the heart of Robert the Bruce. His heart was preserved and then actually taken with some knights who went on crusade. They were ambushed, and when it became apparent that all was lost, they threw his heart into the middle of their enemies and charged behind it to their deaths. The heart of the Bruce was recovered and now rests in Melrose Abbey. Interestingly, in the M.R. James ghost story, Whistle and I'll Come to You, the artifact the professor finds is meant to call a Templar guardian. It appears as a robed and hooded figure with arms outstretched. Thank you so much to Richard for getting in touch and giving us that information. It really did help clear up a couple of our queries and we were fascinated to hear the tale of Robert the Bruce. It was not something I'd come across before. Now I'm afraid that really is all we've got time for today, but we hope you'll join us next episode. Give me peace, Russian, and 